Financial crimes have increasingly become a great concern to governments worldwide. They represent a serious threat to the development of national economies, their stability and sustainability. The European Union is a single market of 27 countries. And while it was formed officially in 1993, it took its member states 25 years longer to agree on the creation of a common public prosecutor's office. It's responsible for investigating, prosecuting and bringing charges against those accused of crimes against the financial interests of the EU. The European Public Prosecutor's Office officially started operations on June 1st of this year. But some of its member states, including Poland, Hungary, Ireland, Denmark and Sweden, remain outside of the agreement. Hungarian Justice Minister Judith Varga says it's a question of sovereignty. The European Public Prosecutor's Office is led by Lara Kavashi. But without full support of all EU member states, how much authority will it have to do its job? And what challenges will Kavashi face as the EU's first chief prosecutor? The head of the European Public Prosecutor's Office, Lara Kavashi, talks to Al Jazeera. European Chief Prosecutor Laura Kaveshi, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. I have to say, it came as somewhat of a surprise to me that it took 25 years to actually open the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Why did it take so long? It was about the negotiations between the member states and to find the, the best way to regulate, because in the end we speak about 22 different member states with 22 different legislations and it was difficult to find a common way to organize this uh, European Public Prosecutor Office. But the, it's the, the world's third largest economy. What were the problems that needed to be overcome? Surely financial fraud must have been one of the key issues. Yes, because the EPPO investigates fraud involving EU funds of, of over 10,000 euros and uh, cross-border VAT fraud involving damage above 10 million euros, but also corruption, money laundering and organized crimes related to this financial fraud. But it's important to say that the baseline estimate in each year is uh, that more than 50 billion euro VAT revenue that it's lost every year in the whole of the EU. So. This means that we needed to have this European Public Prosecutor Office. But why did it take so long? I still don't really understand that if it was so important, despite the fact that you said, you know, 22 countries you had to negotiate with, surely there was a common ground that could have made this earlier? Or was this political? I'm a prosecutor. For me, it's very difficult to comment what happens during the political negotiations. For me, it's important that EPPO started its activity 100 days ago, more than 100 days ago. So we started on 1st of June, and now we are starting to investigate these crimes that falls under our jurisdiction. Uh, you are a prosecutor. You were with the Romanian National Anti-Corruption Directorate. Now, the level of corruption in the public sector in Romania does remain uh, very high. In 2020, corruption uh, perceptions indexed by Transparency International listed Romania as scoring 44 out of 100 and ranking 19th in the European Union and 69th globally. Not a great statistic, for, but what do you bring to the table? I'm here to speak about the European Public Prosecutor Office, but if you speak about the specific member states and about the corruption, I have to say that not only the, time, the statistics are the only ones who are important, because when we speak about the combating corruption, it's not important just to put the people behind bars or to convict them. It's also important to prevent. And uh, I think when we speak about corruption, we have to take into consideration these two main important uh, uh, fields, uh, prevention and investigation. Related to the, the cases that were investigated in my previous positions, there are public statistics. So I prefer to comment about the activity of the European Public Prosecutor Office. Well, one of them is going to be dealing with your own government, a uh, government that actually fired you. How is that going to work? Well, I uh, sent a complaint to the European Court for Human Rights and uh, the, the judgment of the, this uh, European Court was that uh, the way how the, I was fired was not uh, fair and they broke my fundamental rights. Now, what are the main challenges that Europe faces then? Talk to us about, I mean, you talked earlier about the fact that, you know, you've got to deal with 22 member states. So what are the big challenges other than, as you mentioned earlier, cross-border activity? 
Well, uh, it's important to say that for us, uh, as a single prosecutor office acting in 22 member states, as a single supranational authority, if I would make a comparison, it's like a federal uh, authority. Uh, we, the real challenge is to ensure coherence and the sense of belonging to the European Public Prosecutor Office while embedded in the national system, because we have a complex structure. We have prosecutor, European prosecutors at central level in Luxembourg, but we have the European delegated prosecutors who are embedded in the national uh, systems. Uh, and they have full prosecutorial powers. So this is the first, uh, the first challenge. And also we have different challenges related to the existing judicial cross-border cooperation mechanism, because not all the member states uh, participate to the EPPO and we have to act differently. Uh, we have some um, uh, rules to apply when we speak about the participating member states, and there are 22, and also different rules when we speak about the non-participating member states to the EPPO, and there are five countries in this situation. Now, Laura, one of the things the European Union across the board has been accused of is layers and layers of bureaucracy and paperwork and strings, basically, to try and get anything done. Now, your job for financial fraud means that you're going to have a lot more oversight than, say, other bureaus, or do you think you have a direct connection enough to be able to investigate thoroughly and quickly? Well, as I said, we are a single prosecutor office. And what is so interesting about the PPO is the fact that we are a very flexible structure. So we have the ability to investigate cross-border criminality in 22 member states of the EU without cumbersome mutual legal assistance formality. We have immediate access. Uh, to all the information in the cases registered in 22 member states. And we, we are in a unique position to establish connections between cases in different member states. And maybe it's better to give you an example. So recently, uh, we, we have a case in uh, one of our cases with VAT Farcel crowd uh, uh, system. The estimated damage is, is uh, 80 million euros. There are six countries involved. So we perform house searches on froze assets in five EU member states simultaneously. Instead of months, it took us weeks to get this organized. So in fact, of the, of, uh, most of the measures assigned were finalized in uh, less than three weeks. And this is amazing because without having EPPO, we cannot do that. So a prosecutor now, let's take an example for Germany, will call Hill colleagues in France, they will establish what they need and they share information and they, uh, they work uh, in the case without having uh, a very cumbersome uh, procedures to follow. I mean, you paint a very rosy picture, but the European Commission actually recently blocked you from hiring the people that you say that you need to be able to successfully prosecute. Financial fraud investigators, uh, tech guys, um, people like that. You've, you've said that actually I'm being blocked from hiring the people I need. So can you do what you say you can do? Well, uh, it's about the budget and it's about what do we want to achieve with EPPO? Do we want to have a, a, a really independent, efficient and strong institutions? Or we just want to have a new office saying that we have a new European institution. So for us, it was very important to have enough resources uh, to gain our goals. And this is why we, we asked for the European Commission last year to increase our budget. Uh, we get a, 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 mil, a, a budget uh, around 45 uh, million euros, but we need more. We have asked to have the possibility to hire more staff, and we didn't have this, uh, this approval. So we were in the situation that we have to return 7 million uh, euros to the European Commission because we couldn't use those money for different uh, things. Well, I prefer to spend money to, to hire more resources instead to, I don't know, buy flowers or uh, things for, for the office. But in order to be efficient and to fight with the real criminality, we need to have resources, especially human resources. Because as I said, we have a, a case management system 
So we have an electronic system where we have all the cases there. We have access to all the information in 22 member states, and we need to have analysts to connect the dot, to identify the cross-border criminality. And more important, we need to have um, financial experts to be able to recover the damages and to increase the level of recovering the damages in the member states. And in order to do that, we need to have more, more staff. Well, talk to me about the types of criminality you're facing then. What are the, the big ones? Uh, is it simply government officials misspending money or is it stealing? Is it corruption? Well, we have different type of uh, crimes uh, based on our uh, jurisdiction. Uh, we have uh, very uh, few cases uh, with uh, corruption because they are related to the financial fraud. But the most of the cases that we have are related to VAT fraud. And we have um, uh, cases uh, that involve higher damages, as I already gave you an example, more than 80 uh, million euros. We have cases with damages that more than 100 million euros, where the crimes were committed in six or seven member states. And now having EPPO and have, uh, having immediate access to all the information, we opened few investigations that possible in future will be connected with uh, all 22 member states. So in this moment, our target is to investigate cross-border criminality and organized crimes groups. When you say organized crime groups, a lot of that money has been spent by organized criminal associations, and this is fairly well documented, in providing and getting... Um, giving bribes in order to receive protection from people like yourself. Are you following the money higher up the chain or is it just criminality you're interested in? No, for us it's very important to follow also the money, to recover the damages, because based on my previous experience, I saw that uh, sometimes the criminal prefer to spend some time in prison instead to lose their money. So, but uh, with EPPO now, we have the possibility to launch strategic strikes against organized criminal groups, uh, because uh, let us be clear, they are our ultimate ter target. They launder money through also sophisticated webs of activities. They are infiltrating and distorting the legal uh, economy. They are infiltrating and corrupting institutions at uh, all levels. So with EPPO now, we can be more efficient and uh, in investigating this type of uh, crimes. Uh, Laura, it's going, to be, it's going to come as a surprise to a lot of people that organized criminal gangs can get access to EU money. How does that happen? Just give us a case example. Well, uh, I think it was not... Uh, well, but the answer is easy. We didn't have EPPO. And usually, the, the investigators, even if they were uh, prosecutors or police officers, they were focused in the criminality that, are, uh, that was committed in their member states. And not all the time they had this possibility to find the information about the activities that were committed abroad. So this will change with EPPO because we can have uh, direct contact. We, ha we are a single office. We have prosecutors in 22 different member states. So for example, a few weeks ago, we, uh, we opened an investigation in one member state. Immediately, the prosecutor from that member state called the other colleagues to see if there are links uh, between his case and the other cases that were registered. He found out that there are links, and now we can merge the cases. We can put all the cases in one big case, and we can investigate it uh, very easy. Also, uh, a big achievement having EPPO is the fact that we have this electronic system, case management system, and we can immediately identify all the connections between different uh, uh, persons or different legal entities that are investigated and the system flag you that there are connections between different cases that are registered in different member states because this was one of the main issues that, uh, that uh, exists. So now for the first time uh, is that by consolidating investigations in a single supranational authorities, we can obtain an overall view of the crime in our jurisdiction. So we can identify the modus of Randi. So 
In this co uh, context, cases have already come to light in which law enforcement agencies from different member states were conducting parallel investigations into the same complex without uh, knowledge of each other. So now it's different with the PPO. But Laura, uh, a lot of European taxpayers who fund the European Union, uh, frankly, are going to be surprised that there weren't safeguards put in before. Surely, as a criminal organisation, I should not be able to get access to EU funding, however I'm getting it. Uh, are European taxpayers being defrauded themselves because the European Public Prosecutor's Office didn't exist? It's very difficult to say that there is a different leaks, but uh, I can say that it... Uh... There were a lot of differences between the member states before having a PPO, because, for example, the number of the investigations was uh, very different. It was a very different level of uh, political will to identify, to, de de to detect, to identify this crime. It was a different approach between the prosecutor offices and the police to investigate this type of crimes. In some member states, to investigate uh, frauds with EU money was not a priority. Now with EPPO, this will be changed. Uh, and it was not any, let's say, a strategic approach of this phenomena. Now, Laura, the pandemic has provided you with a particular challenge. It's a very new office. You've only been around since um, the beginning of 2021, uh, the middle of 2021, rather. Now. Pandemic recovery packages have to be delivered quickly. When money is being delivered that quickly, there are sometimes, let's say, shortcuts or at least um, easing of restrictions, regulations, which can lead to fraud and corruption. But there's a lot of money. It's $800 billion. How are you going to keep an eye on all of that money and make sure that it is corruption-free, that it is criminal-free? Well, I hope that we will get more uh, budget because uh, the budget of EPPO in this moment it's around uh, 49 million euros. So we have to defend this huge amount of money with the stuff that we have and with this small uh, budget. But uh, uh, in the end, we have to keep in our mind that more money, more flexibility means a higher risk to have uh, more frauds. And we already registered few cases related to the pandemic uh, situations. Uh, for example, uh, in Italy, together, uh, Guarda di Finanza, based on the request of the EPPO, have seized more than 11 million for smuggling personal protective uh, equipment and for committing a, uh, aggravated fraud against uh, healthcare facilities. So we already have some cases. It's important for us to be able to, to establish priorities in our activities and to use all our resources. Now, Laura, just talk to me about aggravated fraud. I mean, that sounds like something that should have been caught way before the European Public Prosecutor's Office should have got involved. It should have been caught by the Italians themselves. Why wasn't it? Well, uh, this is one of, of the examples of the cases that we have. Uh, Italy is uh, an important participant to the EPPO, and we have a, a relationship. We already started to have working arrangement with the specialized prosecutor office, and we will have in future with Guarda di Finanza and with Carabinieri. They have a huge experience in dealing with this type of crime, but it's important to... to uh, to take into consideration that the organized groups are not national anymore. So they used to money uh, lend, uh, to, uh, uh, to move their money in the different member states. They are used to, to work in different member states. And this is why it's so important, to, because now we have EPPO, but also it's so important to work together with the national authorities. Now, is the EU, by setting up the European Public Prosecutor's Office, using you as political cover. For example, it would be very easy for the EU to say, actually, we have the European Public Prosecutor's Office, that's a box ticked, and so we're doing something about corruption. But if they're not giving you the money that you need, how serious is the European Commission? Are they serious about your office? I cannot comment on this. I will give you some statistics. In the first three months of uh, EPPO, we already uh, processed more than 1,700 crime reports. We started three, more than 300 investigations, and many more are still under the evaluation. 
And there is already an estimated damage to the EU budget of point, uh, uh, 4.5 billion euros in those activity that are uh, under our investigation. So only in three months, we discover damages that uh, more than uh, four uh, and a half billion euros, but we have a very small budget. So this is why I said, if we want a tiger or if we want a pipe, puppy, this is that in the end, the politicians should decide. Uh, me, as a European chief prosecutor, my duty is to underline what we need, to ask for the budget, to explain why we need the budget. But in the end, the politicians are those who decide and who should have this responsibility to decide what EPPO should be, a strong institution or just another institution uh, in EU. Now, let me just read you a quote from uh, one of the German Green MEPs, Daniel Freund. The European Commission, uh, the EU commissioners, has so far not been serious about protecting the rule of law in Europe. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen must now decide. Either she fights with us for the rule of law or she gives in to pressure from Poland and Hungary and continues to do nothing. Is the EU serious about protecting its own money? Well, usually I do not comment what the politician what the politician said, so I will not comment. Yeah, well, the politicians are the ones that decide where you're with the budget. The politicians decide what sort of strategy you have. You have to deal with these people. Why won't you comment on their on their words? Well, we are prosecutors. We are a technical level, and uh, you know, EPPO is an independent institution. But indeed, when we speak about independence, we have to take into consideration the budget. And we have to take into consideration that also the budget of the institution, when we speak about judiciary, when we speak about the prosecutorial office, is related to the independence. Now we have a regulation who said who has to approve the money. And as I said, our job is to ask, but in the end, they will decide if they really want to respect the independence of EPPO or not. Now, you've talked about your successes uh, in the past, um, but... Let's talk about the future of the EPPO. Where would you like to see your office go? I think my main goal in my mandate would be to, as I said, to have a strong EPPO, independent, efficient, but more important, to win the trust of the citizens in our activity. For me, this is the main goal, because if you are efficient, the people trust in you. If that's the case, then why are Poland, Hungary, Ireland, Denmark and Sweden remaining outside of the EPPO? In the future, would you like to see those countries get in? And why, at the moment, aren't they in? Well, this is a political decision and I think they should explain why they are not in. But I hope uh, that in future we can cooperate with our uh, colleagues, our prosecutor colleagues from these member states inside of the EPPO. Maybe our activity will convince them that they should, uh, they should join. But the Hungarian Justice Minister, Judith Varga, said it's a question of sovereignty. Clearly, you're ruffling some feathers. Well, as I said, uh, EPPO, it's a single supranational authority and uh, uh, there is no obligation for the member states to be in, but if they are in, they, they should work and they should do everything that is necessary for EPPO to be, to be efficient. So I cannot comment on the declaration of the Minister of Justice from Hungary. European Public Prosecutor Laura Kaveshi, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Okay, thank you very much for the interview.